we've been in the computer, computer, computational group in home office for almost a year mm -hmm. in order to allow the lab people to work here so that there yeah, are not too many people in the yeah. building. Great, fantastic. fantastic. I have my own history with molecular archaeology, 22 oh, years yeah? ago. Yes, <laughs> in mm -hmm. Salvador, because uh, there is a place in the city center they uh, they were uh, doing uh, construction <laughs> and they found 350 skeletons of approximately 300 to 400 years uh, ago and then we try to mm -hmm. extract the dna and well it's by that time was very difficult to <laughs> standardize everything. I remember that I I yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I I I had to to make all the things <laughs> with the uh, with the paper of I, I don't know if uh, he is uh, director of the Institute of Molecular Biology. Uh, I, I, Paabo, Paabo, P A A B O. Pablos. He's the yes. director. Yeah, well, direct. I remember. I I I read this article. I put everything, make everything. It was terrible to extract DNA from these uh, bones yeah. and and teeth. Uh, and and did, were you successful? 150 years ago. Terrible. You have to. Everything must be standardized. Everything you have uh, about the, the the contamination. You have to be uh, barcoded. <laughs> it's yep. not a, a, a very everything very 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 strict. I, I have much much more how to say uh, frustrations. <laughs> but uh, uh, but <laughs> but it's 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 very very interesting it's uh, 22 years ago i i worked with that uh, from 1999 I mean, 22 years ago yeah 22 crazy okay. crazy <laughs> I, I have to make everything the uh, the there were no kits everything that, exactly uh, <laughs> at this time uh, this was uh, not standard <laughs> everything by hand Everything. Now we use, I mean, now we move to the point, I won't talk about this, but we move to the point now where our lab team um, has automated much of the, the first part of the process. So we prepare oh, um, in plate format, multiple samples simultaneously on a micro pipetting robot so oh, that we can um, try and work always in, in batches. In batches. Um, this has become important when you want to screen lots and lots of samples from yes. big sites, because otherwise doing it manually is just <laughs> incredibly time consuming. Yes. Hey, I remember I, I, I had to, to, to make everything, all the reagents that we use, yep. everything. I can imagine. And were you using PCR Fresh. to amplify mitochondrial sequence? Data? Yes. Yeah. Uh, working with the global gene. Okay. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It's okay. amazing how far things have come. Yeah. So it's what great is... to have this talk so people get to know each other, right? I think, Arthur, that we are getting there. So yes. if you would we like are... to be in charge of chairing the session. Yeah, 93 participants, 94. Wow. Mm -hmm. Great. Almost 100 from all parts of Brazil and from foreign uh, countries also. Perfect. Arthur, okay. you lead. So, so let's start. So good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. José Miguel Ortega for the invitation to coordinate this seminar as part of the BRAS seminars a very important initiative to congregate different Brazilian PhD programs in the field of bioinformatics. Uh, this afternoon, Dr. Janet Kelso will present us the seminar titled What We Have Learned from Analyzing Ancient Genomes. I feel very honored to introduce you, Dr. Janet Kelso. Janet did her education in South Africa, where she obtained two bachelor degrees in biological science and in medical biochemistry. In 2003, she obtained her PhD degree at the University of Western Cape in Cape Town under the supervision of Professor Winston Hyde. And since 2004, Janet is a group leader of the Minerva Research Group 
for bioinformatics of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. Her research line is devoted to genome sequencing and characterization of human ancient genomes, such as Neanderthals and Denisovans, with functional and evolutionary implications. She has published more than 100 papers and is certainly one of the world's most important researchers in this field. She's an editor of several important journals in the field of genomics, bioinformatics, and computational bio biology, including bioinformatics, database, genome biology, plus one, and Springer book series on bioinformatics. Also, she was vice president and executive board member of the International Society of Computational Biology, the ISCB. It is a member of the advisory board of many international institutions. So thank you very much, Janet, for accepting our invitation to give us this seminar. And thank you so much, Artur and Miguel, for the, for the invitation. I feel very welcome after this very nice chat at the beginning. I want to share my screen, but at the moment, I don't think I can. Miguel. Does it work? Yes, now I get it, I guess. Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay, I think that should now work. Let me play. And I hope that you now see my screen. Yes, it's okay. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, as I said, thank you so much. I really, I'm really enjoying being here and, and talking and seeing many um, old friends. Um, as you all know, I think, I, you know, this audience, this is an amazing time to be working in computational biology. In the past decade, we've seen these massive advantages, advances in, in sequencing technologies um, and in molecular technologies, which means that we're now able to generate huge amounts of genomic data. And that data is allowing us to explore the diversity of people who live today, of modern humans across the planet. And I think everyone's aware that, that we're getting a lot of insights into the genetic basis of disease and also into human history. And one of the fields that's been completely revolutionized by these technologies is ancient genomics. And we were just talking about what one had to do 22 years ago. This field of ancient genomics has taken off in the last 10 years. And we're now able to sequence DNA from long extinct organisms, both from bones and from teeth, but also from sediments. So I started my group here in 2004. And the year after that, we began to discuss in our, in our lab meetings with Svante Pebo, who's the director of our department whether it would be feasible to sequence the nuclear genome of an extinct human, of, of a Neanderthal. And I remember those meetings and they were very, um, people were very skeptical that this would work. It just didn't seem feasible at that time in 2005, given that we had Sanger sequencing technologies and, um, and PCR. And, and we decided to give it a shot to try and make libraries from a Neanderthal bone, um, but it wasn't at all obvious that it would be possible to generate a whole nuclear genome sequence from a Neanderthal. And so today what I want to share with you is what's been possible in the last 10 years and show you some of the ways in which we've used the genomes of archaic humans together with those of modern humans, which are being generated by many labs around the world to study population history, both of us, the modern humans, and of archaic humans, and one of the things that I've been most interested in is how interbreeding between modern archaic humans has shaped our diversity um, and also the diversity of Neanderthals. And I'll talk a little bit about a recent study we've done on that. And also how it's contributed to um, adaptation and to disease. Of course, we humans are really curious about our past, right? There are many ways in which we can look into our history. And until quite recently, one of the primary ways we had in, in which we'd learned about our history was from going to sites like this and digging up things. And so these archeological excavations, such as the one you see here, allow researchers to reconstruct history and prehistory from the fossil remains that they find. So from the bones and the teeth of people who lived in these sites, but also from the tools and from the art that was left behind by those people. And we begin to get an idea of who lived there for how long they lived there and what kinds of people they were. And it's from this, it's from this fossil record that we know that up until about 40,000 years ago, there were many different kinds of human forms coexisting over quite extended periods of time, over millions of years across the planet. At the point that modern humans emerge, which is really up here in, in the last sort of 300,000 years, there were two other hominin groups still in existence um, uh, in Eurasia. The Neanderthals, who I think many people are aware of, and their re other relatives in Eurasia, the Denisovans and a small a group 
group of small humans called Homo floresiensis that you might have heard about, also referred to as the hobbits, um, on the island of Flores in Indonesia. And from the fossil record, we know that the Neanderthals occupied Europe and, and Western Asia from around 400,000 years ago, and that they then disappear from around 40,000 years ago, at a time that overlaps with the spread of modern humans out of Africa and across um, gr the greater part of the, of, of the world, across Eurasia and into Oceania, Australia. But we also know that modern humans and Neanderthals were therefore contemporaneous in Eurasia, living at the same time and perhaps in even the same places for some thousands of years. And one of the ongoing debates before we had genetic data was what was the relationship between these two groups? And so early work by Svante Pebo and Matthias Krings uh, assessed the relationship of modern humans and Neanderthals uh, sort of in the late 1990s using PCR to amplify a few hundred bases of the mitochondrial genome of, the of a single Neanderthal at that point. And they showed that at least mitochondrially, and you can see that here, these are all Neanderthal mitochondrial genes. At least mitochondrially, the Neanderthals form a clade separate from modern humans. The variation of Neanderthal mitochondria is outside of that of modern humans. And this suggested that it was most likely that the Neanderthals had been completely replaced by modern humans leaving Africa. But mitochondrial DNA, as you may know, is only a single locus. It's inherited only from your mother. Um, and it's really that you need autosomal genome sequences to see smaller contributions. And that's because the autosomal genome, the rest of your genomes, chromosomes one through 22, um, are inherited from both parents. And they provide a sort of a mosaic picture of the DNA that's inherited from all your ancestors. And so if there was a Neanderthal among your ancestors, you'd be able to see it in the autosomal sequence. However, in the late 1990s, large scale nuclear genome sequencing of ancient specimens simply wasn't possible. There was no way to do this without PCR. And this is due largely to a number of the characteristics of the DNA that you can extract from ancient specimens and the limited throughput of the sequencing technologies that were available at the time. So the DNA that you get from ancient bones and teeth is highly fragmented. The length of the molecules you get, as you can see from this plot here, um, are on the average of 40 to 50 nucleotides. This depends quite heavily on the age and the preservation conditions. Um, and this short lengths lead to issues both in the lab with retrieval of DNA, but also for the computational side, for, for what my group is worried about, to, for the alignment of these sequences. Because you're, you can see that in, in this quite good sample, a large proportion of your reads are in the sort of 30 to 50 base pair range, which are not easy to align uniquely to a reference genome and therefore to identify them, the, um, the ancient hominin sequences. And we need to identify the ancient hominin sequences because the majority of DNA that we get from ancient bones is microbial. It comes from microbes that colonize the bone um, after the death of the, of the organism, after the death of the individual, as it lies in the, in the ground. And so most of the DNA we get, you know, often all of it when we're unlucky, but you know, up, upwards of, of 80, 90% of the DNA comes from micro microbes, not from the hominin that we're interested in. Um, so we have to have ways to pull out the hominin sequences um, accurately. And then finally, um, the DNA that we get, the little, the little fragments of DNA we get are also chemically modified. And those chemical modifications are the deamination of cytosines to, um, cytosines to uracils, um, which, is, um, which happens during the process of the degradation of the DNA. And those are read as thymines. So we not only have short molecules, we have short molecules that are not perfect matches to the reference genome. And that of course causes again problems for um, accurate alignment and identification of reads that are highly deaminated. And so it was really only with the advent of next generation sequencing technology in around 2005, when we started talking about this, that it was possible to directly sequence ancient molecules to add adapters on the end without having to PCR out known targets and, and directly sequence them and also to sequence them in the quantity that you would need to reconstruct a nuclear genome. If only one to 10% of the molecules you get from any sample are actually target molecules, you have to sequence a lot to get the Neanderthal DNA. And so how does this work? How do you get DNA from a Neanderthal? Well, this step is not the part that my group does. This, this part is done is, um, in the lab of Matthias Meyer. And you see him there in the top right-hand corner. And Matthias is really a molecular wizard. Ma Matthias has worked out 
how to optimize every step of what, what would look like a very standard library, DNA extraction and library preparation process and um, optimize it for the extraction and um, library preparation of very short molecules. And his group over the last 10 years has been driving the front edge of this. You know, how do you pull out molecules that are very short optimally? How do you pull out molecules selectively that are damaged? Because we know if they're damaged, they're probably ancient. So they're more interesting to us than any other molecules. And so we have this sampling where we take from a bone, at least a little bit of powder. We then uh, extract the DNA, prepare the libraries by adding adapters on the ends. And on those adapters, we have, um, we have index sequences, which allow us to uniquely identify the origin of that library. So we, have, we double index these libraries so we can really figure out that these molecules came from our lab. We then sequence those molecules. We're using um, Illumina technologies. Uh, we do not need the advantages provided by all the long read technologies. Our molecules are very short. So we're very happy with 35 to 50 base per weeks. That works for us. And then we generate the, a data set where we have to pull out all the Neanderthal uh, or Denisovan sequences. And we do that by alignment to the human reference using um, a series of tools that we've either taken from the public domain and modified or that we're developing ourselves. And those are aligners that are ancient DNA aware. They know about this damage that's at the end of molecules and they do not penalize it as heavily as they would penalize um, a normal mismatch. And they're also, um, very good with working with short reads and identifying unique uh, placements of short reads. And so using these methods, it's been possible over the course of the last decade or so to sequence to high coverage, to high quality, the genomes of three Neanderthals. We have um, a Neanderthal from Vindia Cave in Croatia, which was the first one that we generated the draft genome from, and we've gone back and sequenced that one further. Um, and we have two, two more Neanderthals, one from Denisova Cave in the Altai, and another from Chikia Sky Cave, which is also in the Altai, not very far away from Denisovan. And these genomes are sequenced to between 30 and 50 fold coverage. And for the non repetitive parts of the genome that are mappable with these short reads, they're of quality that's similar to modern genomes. And so we can use, we can do all the things you would do with the modern genome with them. We can genotype, we can you know, run normal genotyping software, um, taking it into account the deamination and so on. And these genomes form a very important reference panel for other studies, and they're used widely um, by other groups as well. And we make them available. We see that as a very important part of our task to make these genome sequences available, both in uh, sort of a final form, but also the raw data for people to look at if they would like. In addition to that, over the last few years, we've generated um, many more Neanderthals, uh, at least 10 more Neanderthal genomes at more modest coverage, nuclear genomes. Um, these are between one and five fold coverage on, on average, and they, they, they represent some of the geographic range of the Neanderthals. So we have quite a few Neanderthals from Western Europe, as well as some from here um, in the Caucasus, as well as some from here in the Altai. And these genomes have provided us with a number of insights into Neanderthal populations. Um, and I'm not going to have time to go into all of them, but what we know, important things that we know is that the Neanderthals as a group had very low genetic diversity and that they likely lived in rather small, rather isolated groups, probably of 60, 70 individuals. This low genetic diversity will become important in a later part where, that I, I will explain. In addition, the sequencing of the ancient DNA has led to the discovery of a previously unknown group of archaic humans, the Denisovans. And it's really only through the genetic data that these Denisovans are known about. And uh, during our sequencing of Neanderthals, we were given this tiny finger bone, like you can see of it down here in the bottom, this little tiny piece of the proximal phalanx of the hand. Um, and it was thought that that might be Neanderthal, perhaps modern human. And when we sequenced it, it became clear that it was neither Neanderthal nor modern human. And we were able to extract enough DNA from that to generate a high coverage nuclear genome to show that the bone belonged to an individual, um, to a group that is now known um, as Denisovans from where they were found in Denisova cave. And this group of Denisovans we showed um, are a sister group to Neanderthals. They share a common ancestor with Neanderthals somewhere between 350 and 500,000 years ago. The fossil remains of Denisovans are still very limited. So far, they're only identified by DNA from a handful of specimens from the same cave. We have a few teeth um, and a few bone chips. Excitingly, there was a mandible found last year um, in China which might be the first evidence of a Denisovan outside Denisova cave. Unfortunately, it wasn't possible to get DNA from the sample. It's poorly preserved, but a small amount of protein fragments, bone peptide protein fragments could be extracted. 
and were sequenced by mass, mass spectrometry. And, and the authors of that paper showed that one of these peptides carries an amino acid change that we know from the comparison of Denisovan, uh, the Denisovan genome to the Neanderthal and modern human genomes is specific to Denisovans, suggesting that this, this jaw is likely Denisovan. We have subsequently sequenced sediment, so sand from the cave where this bone was found. And you can actually extract DNA from sediment. And we have found Denisovan DNA in the sediment in that cave over quite some period of time, indicating that <clears throat> Denisovans were living at very high altitude in, in the in Tibet um, quite early on already. So the generation of these archaic genomes is really an ongoing project in the department. Um, and we have currently have a project to sequence the genomes of around 100 archaic humans um, and are using those to try and understand both Neanderthal and Denisovan history and also modern human history. So from these genome sequences, we've been able to look at the evolution relationships again between these human groups. They're not just using the mitochondrial genome, but now using the autosomal DNA as well. And in comparing their autosomal genomes, as I said before, we were able to get the most accurate and comprehensive view of the population relationships. And we've learned that, as I said already, from the um, um, mitochondria, I'm sorry, from the Denisova, that the, that the Denisovans and the Neanderthals are sister groups that share a common ancestor around 400,000 years ago. And they split together from modern humans around 760,000 years ago. You may know that besides from the autosomes, there are two other chromosomes, the mitochondrial DNA, which we've already talked about, and the paternally inherited Y chromosome. And so there are three genomic compartments that you can look at these kinds of relationships in. And we would expect that if we compare Neanderthals and Denisovans and modern humans in their mitochondrial genomes and their Y, the mitochondria and the Y should show the same relationships between the groups as we see in the autosomal sequences. So here on the left, you now see the autosomal sequences, and we know that Denisovans and Neanderthals are sister groups. When we added the mitochondrial genomes of the Denisovans in, what we saw was in fact that Denisovans and Neanderthals are not sister groups in their mitochondria. Instead, the Neanderthal uh, mitochondrial DNAs are more closely related to modern human mitochondrial DNAs. They have a much um, shallower divergence time from the modern human mitochondria than they have from the Denisovan mitochondria. And initially we speculated that this might be because the Denisovan carries an unusual mitochondrial genome that might have been contributed to it through gene flow from a very much older human form, a super archaic human. However, a short time after that, after we published that paper, we sequenced some nuclear DNA from, from bones from the Cima de las Huesas. And the Cima de las Huesas in Spain is a site that has been excavated by Juan Luis Suaga and his team. And they uncovered these, a set of um, hominin bones that have been dated to around 400,000 years ago. And from their morphology, from how they look, it's not completely clear whether they're Neanderthals or perhaps some even older group. And what Matthias um, was in, in our group was able to do was retrieve nuclear DNA from the Sima bones and show that the Sima Neanderthals, Sima, Sima individuals are Neanderthals. They're very early Neanderthals, so very old Neanderthals. And they fall, so you see here, they're in purple, they fall quite early on the Neanderthal lineage. However, he also extracted mitochondrial DNA from them. And in their mitochondrial genomes, they're not at all like Neanderthals. So that led us to think that something else was going on, that it was not the Denisovan mitochondria that was unusual, that it was the, in fact the mitochondria of younger Neanderthals that's unusual. And what we think is that the mitochondrial type carried by uh, the, the Sima hominins and also by the Denisovans, so what you see here in pink, might in fact be the original mitochondrial DNA carried by the archaic humans. And that the similarity that we see between the later Neanderthals and the modern humans is a result of gene flow from modern humans, some ancestor of modern humans, that happened sometime after these Sima Neanderthals lived and replaced all the mitochondrial genomes in Neanderthals subsequent to that, after that. Some later work has tried to narrow the time frame in which this might have happened. If we think that the Sima Neanderthals are around 400,000 years ago, we think it's probably after that. And we think it can't have been, um, be it was after 400,000 years ago, but before 200,000 years ago. So some, somewhere between 200 and 400,000 years ago, we think there was um, gene flow from 
what I'm going to call modern humans, but we know modern humans arise and start moving a, a bit later. We think that these are actually sort of proto-modern humans that are contributing their mitochondrial genomes um, to the Neanderthals. This indicates that there must have been contact between modern humans and Neanderthals much earlier than we thought before. Um, and of course, we, what we really wanted to do then was look at the Y chromosome and see what the relationships there looked like, because now we have two of the three components. We have mitochondria and autosomes, and they disagree, and we wondered what the Y would look like. However, despite our many years of work and, and work on many Neanderthals, we didn't have enough DNA from Neanderthal Y chromosomes for any meaningful analysis. And this is simply because um, all the specimens that we've sequenced that I told you about that were well preserved enough to shotgun sequence were all female. So we had no Y chromosomes, only men have Y chromosomes. And so what we did then was we went back through all our specimens, our Neanderthal specimens and Denisovans and tried to identify any that could at all be suitable for Y chromosome sequencing. And Matea Haidinjak, who you see in the top right there, identified a set of three uh, male Neanderthals, these all fairly young Neanderthals from Spain, uh, from Spain, from Belgium and from uh, Russia, as well as two Denisovans, one quite old Denisovan, Denisova 8, and a younger Denisovan, Denisova 4, from which we could make DNA libraries for which we could potentially get Y chromosomes. But we knew that we would not be able to get Y chromosomes by shotgun sequencing. We know that there's very little DNA in these libraries and that there was a huge amount of microbial DNA present. We would have to have sequenced so much that we wouldn't have been able to afford it. And so what we did, um, what Martin Peter, who you see here on the top right in my group did, was to use the sequence of the modern human Y chromosome to design a set of capture probes, DNA probes, that tile the Y chromosome very densely, the non-repetitive part of the Y chromosome, and allow us to fish out about seven megabases of the single copy sequence of the non-recombining part of the Y chromosome. And so that's what you see here, the piece of uh, uh, the many probes tiled densely across the modern human Y chromosome. And we use those then to fish out DNA from these rather um, microbially contaminated libraries that we have. And that worked really surprisingly well. Um, we applied those capture probes to the libraries um, and we were able to ret retrieve um, for, for the Neanderthals between 0.8 and 15 fold coverage of the Y chromosomes. And for the two Denisovans, um, between one and a half and three and a half fold coverage of the Y chromosomes, giving us our very first view of the Y chromosomes of Neanderthals and, and Denisovans. And Martin, had, Martin did an amazing analysis here, you know, going through very carefully, uh, working out how to call the sequence of the Y chromosomes for each of these individuals and then reconstructing the phylogeny of the Y chromosomes of the Neanderthals, the Denisovans and the modern humans. And as you, you can see here, we find that the Denisovan Y chromosomes, the, the, the Neanderthals and the Denisovan Y chromosomes separate, right? So we have two clades, the Denisovans all clustered together and then and the, the Denisovans all clustered together and the Neanderthals all clustered together. Um, and we see also that the Denisovan lineage splits off before the um, modern human and uh, Neanderthal lineages split from one another. In other words, on the Y chromosomes, modern humans and Neanderthals are more similar to one another, and Denisovans are the outgroup, exactly the same as the case for the mitochondria. So now we believe the truth is the autosomal genome. Neanderthals and Denisovans are sister groups, but somehow they both carry what look like modern human Y chromosomes and modern human mitochondria. Um, so in addition to our observations from, from the mitochondrial DNA, the Y chromosome provides a few more lines of evidence to suggest that really what's going on is population contact with a very early group of modern humans. First, our estimates of the time to the most recent common ancestor of the archaic and modern human Y chromosomes show that the two Denisovan Y chromosomes agree. They split from the common ancestor, so in black, the common ancestor with modern humans between um, seven and 800,000 years ago. And that's in perfect agreement with the population split time inferred from the autosomal sequences, suggesting that the autosomal sequences and the Y chromosomes of Denisovan split from modern humans in a very clean, simple split. By contrast, the three um, Neanderthal Y chromosomes that you see here in blue, they split from the modern human lineage around 370,000 years ago. That's much younger than the autosomal split. You don't expect that, right? If there's a split of the autosomes 700,000 years ago, you didn't expect the Y to have a much later split. 
And the only way that we can see that this could happen is if there was gene flow from a modern human population after the split of the, popu of the Neanderthal, um, and the common ancestor of Neanderthal denisms and modern humans into the Neanderthals. Secondly, if very mod early modern humans contributed both mitochondrial and Y chromosomes to the Neanderthals, then we would expect to see some contribution to the autosomal genomes of Neanderthals too, right? You can't mix together, inherit a Y in a mitochondria, but not get some of the autosomal sequence. You must get some autosomal sequence. And so that was the first thing that people had begun to look at. And in fact, there are two other studies, one from the, uh, Martin Kulvim and one from Melissa Hubitz that have provided evidence for modern human DNA, tracts of modern human DNA in the genomes of Neanderthals that are very short, suggesting that they entered that population a long time ago. That time estimate is 200 to 300,000 years ago, which is very close to the time estimate we come to for this, for this um, gene flow from modern humans to, to uh, Neanderthals. And they calculate that about three to 6% of the Neanderthal genome is probably contributed by this very early modern human population. And then finally, there is an alternate hypothesis, and that's that the gene flow is the other way around, that the Y chromosome and mitochondria in modern humans were replaced by gene flow from Neanderthals. But that's much less parsimonious because we know that Neanderthals were never in Africa. So in order to get this, you have to have the gene flow into modern humans take place in Eurasia. And then you have to somehow import those, um, those um, mitochondria and Y chromosomes back into Africa and have them spread all the way across Africa so that all African populations carry them seems like a much less likely um, possibility. Another puzzle here is how do you explain the complete replacement of two full genomic loci? So the whole Y chromosome, so in all the Neanderthals after SEMA, we see a mitochondrial type that is consistently always modern human-like, and we see a Y type that is always modern human-like, which means that those two loci spread to 100% frequency in those populations, as far as we can tell. Um, and yet we only see three to 6% uh, contribution on the autosomal DNA level. How is that possible? It's rather implausible if we assume that the mitochondria and the Y are evolving neutrally. However, what we think is going on, and there are several, as I said earlier, I'd come back to, the fact that the Neanderthal populations were small or are small at this time is very important. There are indications that because the Neanderthal populations were, are small or were small, um, they accumulated an excess of deleterio deleterious genetic variants. Because in small populations, you're much less efficient at weeding out bad mutations. So, deleterious variants were allowed to accumulate in the, in the Neanderthal population. And we know that on the Y chromosome, that there is a particular sensitivity to the accumulation of deleterious variants because you can't weed them out, same on the mitochondria, you can't weed them out because there's no recombination. Um, and so the accumulation of deleterious variants on the Y and the mitochondria are likely to have particularly severe effects. Um, and so we did a bunch of simple, Martin did, <laughs> a bunch of very simple simulations, assuming around 5% gene flow. Um, and then assuming that there was a 1% reduction in the fitness of the Neanderthal Y chromosome. So in other words, the Neanderthal Y chromosomes were bad, the modern human Y chromosomes were better. And therefore, when there was gene flow from modern humans to Neanderthals, bringing in all parts of the genome, it was the Y and the mitochondria that were selected for because they were better, they were more fit in the, the mitochondria and the Y in the Neanderthals that had been accumulating mutations over quite some time. And I, I, we think, and this is speculation this part, but we think that the role of the crucial role of the Y chromosome in reproduction and in fertility um, mean that even rather small numbers of deleterious mutations or structures variation could have a very large impact on the Y chromosome, which is not true with the rest of the genome. Anyway, our, what we see is the replacement of Neand uh, Neanderthal mitochondria and Y with um, what looks like the mitochondria and Y of very early modern humans. We propose, we speculate that this is due to selection on the modern human mitochondria and Y because they were more fit than those of Neanderthals and Denisovans. Um, 
So to summarize, we think what's going on is that Y chromosomes from modern humans flow into the Neanderthals, all Neanderthals after SEMA, sometime around 200 to 400,000 years ago. The mitochondrial DNA does the same. We do not know that it's the same gene flow event, that it all happened at the same time. It might actually have been different, but I think it's parsimonious to assume it was probably one contact. Um, we think this, is, this encounter between the ancestors of very, very old modern humans living 300, 200 to 400,000 years ago in Neanderthals must have occurred somewhere in Western Eurasia. There is some fossil evidence um, in Greece for modern humans of, of this age. Um, and we think that it did not affect the Denisovans because the Denisovan range is further to the east. So the Denisovans were not in the, in the region at this time. We, select, we suggest that the selection replacement happens because there are fewer deleterious mutations on the modern human mitochondria and Y than, that, than those on the Neanderthals and simulations support that that would be enough of a selective advantage to uh, drive replacement. And our findings make a direct prediction. They predict that Neanderthals who lived before this, before this time of gene flow, like the semen Neanderthals, should carry Y chromosomes that look Denisovan-like. And so we hope that at some point we can get Y chromosomes from, the, from these very old Neanderthals from SEMA to see if we're right or not, because that would be a very obvious way to test if we're correct. And then just the presence of this mitochondria and the Y um, provides genetic evidence for contact between these two human groups that was not known about before. Um, and so giving some insights into how genetics can sort of show us when, when and where people are moving and meeting. So now I'm sort of going to jump forward in time a little bit. Um, the major migration of modern humans out of Africa is not, not these people 300,000 years ago. The major out of Africa migration that led to modern humans to expand and populate Eurasia, the people who were our ancestors, took place much later, took place with modern humans um, entering the Levant and expanding into Eurasia between 70 and 100,000 years ago. So a good 100 to 200,000 years after the event I've just been talking about. And again, by comparing the genomes of, of Neanderthals and Denisovans and modern humans, we've learned that these modern humans that were expanding out of Africa met Neanderthals again and interbred with them again. And that the ancestors of people in present day Asia and Oceania also met the Denisovans and interbred with them. And so we now have an, a, sort of another contact with these archaic groups that has very different effects, which I'll talk to you about next. So what we have is gene flow into modern non-Africans from Neanderthals, such that everyone who has non-African ancestry, so people who are not African, have around 2% Neanderthal DNA. And in addition, the people of Oceania and Australia have as much as 4% Denisovan DNA, in addition to their 2% Neanderthal. And the people of Asia have a small amount, about 0.2% Denisovan ancestry as well. The study of when and where and how many times modern humans have met and encountered and interbred with Neanderthals and Denisovans has been an incredibly active area of research in the past few years quite controversial. And I think there were still, there's still findings to be made here. Um, but we have this very simplified model. This is a simple way of thinking about it for me anyway, is, and is that modern humans arise in Africa around 300,000 years ago, 200 to 300,000 years ago. And they begin to move out of Africa 70 to 100,000 years ago. And at that point, they met Neanderthals who were in Western Eurasia. And when they met Neanderthals quite early on, we suspect while they were still quite a small group, they interbred with the Neanderthals such that everyone who met those Neanderthals um, and carried, carried with them then about 2% of DNA. So the majority of Neanderthal ancestry that we see in people outside of Africa today comes from this very initial interbreeding with Neanderthals. Um, we also have direct evidence of local mixing with Neanderthals from smaller groups that don't contribute very much to people today, but we know that there were people living 30,000 years ago who, were, who had more Neanderthal ancestry than people living today, um, suggesting that they had additional Neanderthal interbreeding in their history. In addition, mainland Asians carry a small fraction of Denisovan DNA, as I said, about 0.2%, and Melanesian groups, particularly the Papuans and the Aboriginal Australians, carry as much as 4%. 
And here there's evidence for quite at least two rounds of mixture with quite genetically divergent Denisovan populations, suggesting that the Denisovan population was spread widely across Asia, possibly as out into Oceania too. There have been recent papers suggesting that Denisovans were living um, in, Pap in, the, in the region of Papua. I think that will be something that will be discussed at length still quite some time. Um, and we also see that those Denisovans are quite genetically distinct from one another, suggesting that they'd been isolated from been isolated groups for quite some time. And so the Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA that we see in, in um, modern human genomes acts a bit like a dye. It's sort of a marker that we carry with us as we move out of Africa, um, allowing us to trace the movements of early, of early humans and their interaction with these archaic humans. Um, and to me, what's become really clear in the last few years is that the history of this mixture is very, very complex. And modern humans, our ancestors moved around a huge amount, which complicates the interpretation of some of the patterns of ancestry that we see, particularly in this region of, of island Southeast Asia, where there's been a huge amount of population movement. And there's quite a lot of archaic ancestry, both Neanderthal and Denisovan. And so the very earliest analyses always looked at how much Neanderthal Denisovan DNA is there in, in each um, population or each individual. But that, those analyses didn't give any indication of how that Neanderthal DNA is distributed. So where in the genome is it? Is it randomly distributed? So it has no effect, hasn't been selected on. This distribution of the introduced DNA is interesting because it informs us about what the selective pressures have been that have acted on the archaic DNA in modern humans since the integration telling us a little bit about what have been the important selective pressures in people that were our ancestors. And so to tackle this question of how the archaic DNA is um, distributed in the genomes, the groups of Josh Aiki and his postdoc Ben Veno and David Wright and his post postdoc Sri Ramchankar Raman developed um, methods to identify Neanderthal and Denisovan introgressed sequences in individual genomes from present day people. And what you see here are sort of these, these maps of where there is Denisovan, or uh, these are um, both Neanderthal maps, am I right? Yeah, uh, Neanderthal DNA in both Asians and in Europeans. So you see Asians in red, Europeans in blue, and the same here. So they're sort of identifying in many thousands of genomes the exact locations of Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA. And what's immediately obvious from these maps is that the, DNA, the archaic DNA, the Neanderthal DNA, is not very evenly distributed. So you can see there are some regions, like down here, I hope you can see my mouse down here, um, and, you know, many gaps where there's just not so much. And then other regions where there's, you know, both, pop, both um, Asians and Europeans carry lots of Neanderthal DNA. And so an analysis from Shriram looked at the genomic regions where Neanderthal DNA is less common. And he noticed that, so what you see here is uh, Neanderthal ancestry proportion on the y-axis in East Asians and East Asians and West Eurasians, and this B value then. And these B values, they're a measure of how much evolutionary constraint there is in the genome in a region. So how, how conserved the sequence is. And the lower B value bins on this side, they represent more functionally important sequence, sequences that's more highly conserved. And so what you'll see is that there's a good correlation between how conserved sequence is and how much Neanderthal ancestry there is. So there's less Neanderthal ancestry in regions of the genome that are more functionally important. This observation has been used to propose that purifying selection, negative selection has acted to remove Neanderthal alleles, Neanderthal DNA around genes or other functional elements in, in modern humans, implying that um, a large proportion of the Neanderthal alleles were deleterious for modern humans and perhaps even that there was some level of hybrid incompatibility. Um, there's been a lot of work on that too. I think I, I am no longer convinced that there is uh, sort of significant hybrid incompatibility. I think it's much more likely that this is a reflection of selection against Neanderthal um, introgressed sequences because it carries, because the sequence carries um, an accumulation of deleterious variants. So these mildly deleterious variants when entering modern human populations are more effectively selected against because the modern human populations are larger. Martin, Peter and my group looked a little bit more closely because people had said, oh, this is clearly that it's DNA in genes that's being selected against. And, and he looked a little bit more closely by looking at the annotations 
um, in the genomic regions and correlating that with the Neanderthal ancestry proportion. Um, and he showed that contrary to the expectation, protein coding genes as a group, which you see here in orange, are exactly what you would expect. They're at the genome-wide average of Neanderthal ancestry proportion, 2%. So it's not the protein coding regions of all genes that are where Neanderthal DNA is being selected against. Um, the selected against, against Neanderthal DNA, if you look here, is strongest in regulatory sequence, in promoters, um, and also in the most ultra-conserved regions of protein coding genes. And this depletion in promoters and in regulatory, regulatory sequences is something we've seen in numerous studies. And it seems to suggest that Neanderthals might have differed more from humans in their regulatory um, architecture than in their protein coding architecture, which I think makes sense. It's probably more likely that you change the genes regulation than that you, that you change the protein that it's encoded. It's also in, consistent with work done in another group that inferred differences in the regulatory architecture of modern human and Neanderthal genes, looking at um, allele specific splicing in integrated sequences. So, there is this pattern that a large proportion of the introgressed archaic sequence is selected against. However, this is not true everywhere. In some parts of the genome, the amount of introgressed sequence um, is high. And what you see here is just an example. It's a piece of chromosome nine. And uh, so you see it, the position along chromosome nine on the x-axis and the mean Neanderthal ancestry on the y-axis. And you see it plotted for two populations, all Europeans and all East Asians in the thousand genomes data set. And you can see there are some regions where there's no Neanderthal, apparent Neanderthal ancestry. And you can see there are some regions where just one population, 60% of the individuals in one population carry Neanderthal alleles at this position, but not in the other population. And you can see there are some places where in both populations, a, an appreciable proportion of individuals carry Neanderthal alleles. So we're seeing sort of both general selection in all populations on Neanderthal DNA, for Neanderthal DNA, positive selection, and um, regional local selection in some, sometimes in just smaller populations um, on introgressed Neanderthal sequence. At least some of these are consistent with po positive selection. We were quite interested to look at some of the most compelling candidates and so Micha Dunneman, who you see here, who was a postdoc in my group, began to try and identify introgressed archaic alleles that might have been advantageous for modern humans and to try and understand how that was the case. How do they act? What are the mechanisms? And so what we did to start with was we scanned the genomes of around 1,500 present day people from populations around the world and identified potentially introgressed Neanderthal alleles. And so you sort of walking, this is a piece of chromosome four, walking across, we identify all the places where we have um, a match in one of the uh, present day individuals to a Neanderthal allele that doesn't match an African. And then we check that we have these two maps that I talked about of Neanderthal introgression. We check that these regions fall inside the two maps. So these are regions that are likely consistent with having been introgressed. And we looked at the lengths of the haplotypes. So how long the piece of Neanderthal DNA in the genome is. Um, because the length is related to how important it's been, how selected it's been. And one candidate at the very beginning stuck out, and this, that's the candidate that you see here. It's a region on chromosome four. It's 143 kilobases long, which is about three times as long as you expect by chance. It means it's probably being um, maintained by selection. And it encompasses, we were interested in it because it encompasses three genes of a single family. These uh, toll-like receptors, they are called. Um, and the toll-like receptors are interesting because they play a very critical role in innate immunity. And the innate immune system is the part of our immune system that is the first to respond to pathogens. So it's sort of the untrained part. These three toll-like receptors are, as far as we can tell, one of them is a bit uncertain, but they're cell surface receptors to, the, to our, the best of our knowledge. So they sit on the cell surface. They belong to a large family of, of toll-like receptors, some of which are inter intracellular. And they sit on the cell surface and they add a, act a bit like a surveillance system for the cell. They recognize microbial surface, surface proteins, they recognize lipopolysaccharides. And when they detect them, they're critical in eliciting an inflammatory response and an antimicrobial response, and then activating the um, adaptive immune system. 
And as such, they're a really important line, first line of defense against bacterial pathogens. Now, immunity, immunity as such is an, is an important, a, a very strong selective pressure. So it's something that we know that introgression has acted on quite, has had quite strong effects on. So anyway, what we did was we extracted this 143 kilobase region from the genomes of 2,500 modern humans, and we clustered them together. And we clustered them into haplotypes or stretches of DNA that differ by fewer than one in a thousand nucleotides, trying to find similar, similar, sim similar clusters of, of um, haplotypes, introgressed haplotypes. And this re resulted in the seven core haplotypes that you see here with the Roman numerals. We then aligned the consensus sequences of these seven haplotypes to the genome sequences of the Neanderthal and the Denisovan, as well as outgroups. We used chimpanzee and orangutan. And what you see here is a neighbor joining tree of the seven haplotypes together with the Neanderthal and Denisovan and outgroup genomes. And what you can see, um, there's lots of information on this. What you can see in the numbers here is how many chromosomes carried each haplotype. And what you see in the colors tells you where in the world we saw this haplotype. So in red, we are haplotypes we see in, in Africa, um, green is in Asia and yellow in America and blue in Europe. So here, this haplotype five is the most common haplotype seen in 3,800 chromosomes. And you can see it's seen worldwide. This is the modern human haplotype, sort of base modern human haplotype. You can see that there are three distinct haplotypes in modern humans that are more similar to the ancient genomes than they are to any modern genome. We have one quite common haplotype, haplotype three. Th almost a thousand of the chromosomes carry this haplotype. This haplotype is clearly more similar to the Neanderthal genome than it is to any of the modern human genome, other modern human genomes. And haplotype four, which is not as common, also more similar to the Neanderthal. You also see that these are found um, primarily in uh, haplotype four only in Asia and haplotype three in Asia, the Americas, and and, um, Europe. We also find a rather rare haplotype, a Denisovan haplotype, um, haplotype two, seen in two individuals in South Asia. So we already, so we have evidence here that not only do we have introgression from one Neanderthal, we have potentially introgression from two Neanderthals and a Denisovan at this locus, um, suggesting that this this toll-like receptor locus has been introgressed multiple times and potentially selected multiple times. This is the same data just plotted onto a map. And um, just looking at the Neanderthal haplotypes at the moment, uh, in orange and green, you can see the orange haplotype, which is the more common one, is present in all non-African populations. You can see the green haplotype, which is more rare, is present only in Asia. Um, that's consistent with uh, a number of papers that have shown that there's an additional pulse, suggested that there's an additional pulse of, Denisovan and, of Neanderthal ancestry in Asia. You can also see that the frequencies as indicated by the amount of the pi that the haplotype takes up, the frequencies of the orange haplotype vary quite widely. In fact, there's a north-south gradient in Europe with a low, low um, frequency, lower frequency in the north and a higher frequency in the south. And there's an east-west gradient in Asia with higher frequencies of the Neanderthal-like haplotype in the far, in the far east in, in the in further west. We think, um, some analyses we've done suggest that this haplotype, this toll-like receptor haplotype has been selected multiple times in different populations in response to different diseases. But how does it work? So to try and understand what's going on, we thought maybe there was some change in the protein sequence. So we had a look at all the SNPs that, um, all the, the, the archaic like, like SNPs, but none of them modifies the protein coding sequence of any of the toll-like receptors. But we saw an enrichment of archaic variants within known transcription factor binding motifs, suggesting that the effect, if there is one, of this Neanderthal-like haplotype might be regulatory. It might change the regulation, how much of the toll -like, each of these toll-like receptors is expressed. And we were fortunate enough to have gene expression data, RNA-seq data, from lymphoblastoid cell lines, from the same individuals from whom we had the genomic data, the same thousand genomes individuals. And so we asked whether the individuals who carry Neanderthal-like alleles um, in the regulatory region express their toll-like receptors differently from individuals that carry modern human alleles in the toll-like receptors. And um, what you see here are plots of the expression of each of the three toll-like receptors. Um, 
in these lymphocytes. And on the left, you have individuals carrying two copies of the Neanderthal um, toll-like receptor. In the middle, you have individuals who are heterozygote carrying one copy of the Neanderthal and one of the modern human. And then the, on the right, individuals who are, carry just the modern human haplotype. And what you can see consistently for all three toll-like receptors is that there's significant difference in expression depending on whether you carry the Neanderthal um, alleles with homozygote, homozygote Neanderthal individuals showing the highest expression, heterozygotes having an intermediate expression and homozygote human um, alleles carry, having the lowest expression. This is true for all three toll-like receptors. I don't think that that's particularly um, exciting. They're sitting on a single haplotype. They're probably regulated together. Um, so this is not an independent, these are not independent signals. Um, interestingly, uh, we wanted to see, but we, would, we decided we would be more convinced if this was really a tissue specific effect, that you see it in sort of blood tissues like lymph lymphocytes. And indeed, we looked in um, the GTEx data set and we see that we only see this effect in lymphoblastoid cell lines and lymphocytes. We don't see it in any other tissue. So we only have a differential expression in what I would consider to be the most relevant tissues we had available. So now we have a molecular phenotype. We think perhaps the Neanderthal introgressed sequence is modifying the expression of the toll-like receptors and actually increasing the expression of the toll-like receptors. Um, and we wondered whether this is just something that you see on the expression level or whether it might have an organismal phenotype too. And so to look at that, we went to public genome-wide association study data from humans. And these are studies that link genetic variants um, to phenotypes in large cohorts. And at the point that we did this analysis, there were 79 SNPs in this 143 kilobase region that, and 13 of them introgressed archaic-like SNPs. When we looked at the studies that those SNPs were from, they're from just two studies. Archaic-like variants, uh, archaic-like haplotypes showed significant stations in the two studies. One is a study of common allergy from 23andMe, where this region is the, the most significant hit. Um, this is a study of common allergies, allergies to pet, dander, dust, pollen, people self-reporting, I have asthma or, or hay fever. And the second study is a study as, uh, looking at the um, infections with Helicobacter pylori. It's a bac bacteria that infects the stomach and is associated with gastric ulcers. And here we see again that the same region is the, the most highly associated region with this. And in both studies, the archaic introgressed variants were the most strongly associated. And the archaic like alleles are consistently associated with a decreased incidence of Helicobacter pylori infection, so more resistance to Helicobacter pylori, and, and incre increased susceptibility to common allergies. And here, we speculate wildly because we don't have direct evidence, but our speculation was that we might be seeing some kind of trade-off, that the Neanderthal-like haplotypes increase the expression of the toll-like receptor genes, leading to increased um, surface expression of the toll-like receptor proteins, thereby enhancing immune surveillance and reactivity against some pathogens. However, by doing this, you might increase the sensitivity to everything, including non-pathogenic um, allergens like pollens and grasses and resulting in allergies in people living today. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that we have, that these alleles are responsible for resistance against Helicobacter pylori. I think what we're seeing is a signal, we just have data for Helicobacter pylori. It's probably a more general signal of a resistance to potentially many pathogens. And some, there have been some papers speculating that this locus is associated with, um, with plague as well, that there might have been some advantage um, in, in the plague from these alleles. So most of the studies that have been done on Neanderthal alleles um, and on modern human phenotypes inferred the impact from the function of the genes, so like we did here. But there's a more direct way to do this, and that's to look at associations between integrated Neanderthal DNA and phenotypes of interest. But to do this, you really need um, large numbers of individuals for which you have genotype data and detailed information, ideally about lots of phenotypes. And that kind of data was not very common until quite recently. So there was a first study of this sort done with medical um, electro electronic health records in a few thousand, 28,000 individuals by Samantia et al. Very nice study. 
where they looked at the um, association of Neanderthal alleles with medical phenotypes. At a similar time, we started looking at the UK Biobank, which is um, an amazing resource collecting and making available genotype data and extensive phenotype data for, at the point that we looked around 500,000 British individuals. Um, sorry, it, now it's around 500,000. When we looked, it was about 150,000 individuals. We looked at the pilot data. And using the pilot data, we evaluated for the first time the contribution of Neanderthal and Tregress alleles to um, 130 different phenotypes. So this is 130 largely non-disease phenotypes. So these are traits that people reported about themselves. Basic um, biometric information, height, weight, um, likes, dislikes, dietary preferences, smoking practices, all sorts of things. Um, how much they drink, how much they smoke, what they like to eat. And we ask whether there's an association of Neanderthal alleles with any of these things. And to do that, we start by controlling for ancestry and relatedness, so sort of cleaning up the data. We trim the data set down from 150,000 to 115,000 individuals. And from the 800,000 SNPs genotyped for each individual, we then identify Neanderthal and progressed variants present in each of these individuals. We look for the Neanderthal variants in their, in their genetic data. We identify sites where there are at least 100 individuals in the biobank who carry Neanderthal alleles at a certain site, but do, do not carry um, African alleles. And we check that they fall into regions that, where there's evidence for introgression. So we're sort of highlighting blocks of introgress sequence that we can associate phenotypes with. Um, because the Neanderthal DNA occurs in blocks, we cluster the variants that are in linkage with one another and choose a tag SNP just to represent each of the, the introgress chunks of DNA. And that gave us about 6,000 uh, archaic tag SNPs, and we had a match set of non-archaic tag SNPs. And then we can test for association between the presence of a Neanderthal allele and each of these phenotypes. And in doing that, we found that there were 15 genome-wide significant associations of Neanderthal alleles with 11 distinct phenotypes. You see these phenotypes here. These included uh, sleep patterns, the uh, blood pressure, these impedance measures, which are me a measure of muscle fat proportion uh, and body size, uh, particularly the sitting height. But fascinatingly, more than half of the associations involved the skin and hair system. So skin and hair biology, which was surprising to us, and particularly pigmentation traits. Um, now pigmentation of the skin and hair is um, one of the very obvious differences between human groups. Pigmentation traits, likely evolved in response to differences in sunlight at different altitudes. And darker pigmentations are then protective against UV damage and lighter pigmentations facilitate the synthesis of vitamin D, which is critical for health. Um, pigmentation is also complicated. It's likely a target of sexual selection. Interestingly, we know very little about the skin and hair color of, or hair, skin and hair pigmentation of Neanderthals. And we thought maybe we could learn something from what we see in you know, the introgressed sequences in modern humans. So we could see like if we have an introgressed Neanderthal sequence, maybe we can predict what color the Neanderthal hair is based on what people carrying that allele look like. And um, our hopes were dashed when we looked at the strongest association candidate with pigmentation. This is a region around a gene called BNC2, which is known to affect skin color. Um, we thought that this would be a simple conclusion However, we found two introgressed Neanderthal loci in and around BNC2, both at quite high, quite high frequency. So there are a lot of individuals carrying these in the UK biobank, which is British people, to be very clear. Um, interestingly, this haplotype here, haplotype A, is associated with fairer skin, with poor childhood, with increased childhood sunbur sunburns, more bad tan. So people who just have very fair skin. Whereas this uh, haplotype here, individuals who carry that, they tend to have more olive skin, darker skin. And so the simplicity of we can infer Neanderthal skin and hair pigmentation from these studies fell away immediately because we have evidence here for, for both um, ne Neanderthal DNA in influencing pigmentation in both directions. One interpretation could be that Neanderthals themselves were variable but we don't know. I think this will be an interesting area for future work, trying to determine if there is, um, if there is a way to use the integrated sequences to determine something about Neanderthal phenotypes that we don't know from the fossil record. 
So in this section, I've shown you some examples of how Neanderthal introduced DNA influences traits in modern humans. And I've talked about immunity and I've talked about um, what I would consider environmental adaptation. And there's this growing list of Neanderthal alleles that have been either adaptive for modern humans or deleterious for modern humans. And every now and again, you might see a new paper on this. Interestingly to me, the sequences that have been adapt adaptive or advantageous for modern humans seem to largely influence genes related to immunity and metabolism and response to the environment, things like response to temperature, to sunlight and to altitude. And so in trying to synthesize this, I thought about, you know, Neanderthals and Denisovans lived in Eurasia for more than 300,000 years. They were presumably quite well adapted to the local environments, to the foods, the climate, the pathogens. And it's therefore perhaps not so very surprising that some of the archaic alleles that entered the modern human population from Neanderthals and Denisovans might have been adaptive for people arriving in Eurasia from Africa, right? You're coming from a place where you haven't seen the same pathogens, you enter an environment and you meet people who are adapted to those pathogens and have genetic ad adaptations to those pathogens and you inherit, inherit them. Normally, adapt, sort of under a, without any admixture, under a simple model, adaptation to a new environment through the acquisition of new mutations is a very slow process, right? You get a new mutation in a single individual. It's rare for those mutations to arise. They can be lost easily by chance. And into breeding, gene flow from another population can then provide an important way for favorable alleles that are present in one population to be introduced into another population at a frequency of a few percent so that they're less likely to be lost. Therefore, ensuring that these advantageous alleles can't get lost and could be acted on by positive selection. So I like to think, and I think it's a reasonable hypothesis, that admixture with archaic humans provided modern humans with a genetic toolbox, um, adaptive alleles that in the new environment were potentially advantageous and that were at some point up following the integration selected. Now there's a lot of, a couple, a couple of recent papers that have stressed that the introgressed variants need not have been adaptive immediately. They just have to have hung around at a reasonable enough frequency that at some point after their introduction, they can be selected on and, and increase in frequency. And sort of drawing to a close then, um, I hope I've been able to convince you with just this really light overview of everything, that, many different things that have been found that, that sequencing ancient genomes is more than just a curiosity. Genomes are actually an interesting resource a useful resource that can be used to learn about the history of us as modern humans, um, of, uh, learn about the origins of advantageous and disadvantageous genetic variation in our genomes, um, the patterns of Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestry that we see in people living today tell us something about when and where they met the Denisovans and the Neanderthals, and they also tell us about how the diversity of the Neanderthals and Denisovans and of us have been shaped by our interactions with one another. Also looking at the introgressed Neanderthal DNA, and I've focused on Neanderthal DNA because we have the most, um, the best phenotyping available for individuals who are in Eurasia. Um, points us at traits and selective pressures that have been important in modern humans. And as I've told you, I think those things are about environmental adaptation, immunity, um, diet, metabolism, uh, temperature, altitude. And then, I hope that by linking archaic integrase DNA to phenotypic traits, we might be able to also use this to unravel the genetic architecture of these traits because Neanderthal DNA or in introgress DNA, because it's come in quite recently and it sits in long blocks, is quite easy to identify, allowing us to identify sort of what is the effect of, of this region of the genome on a, on a phenotype. So I want to finish by uh, with a few acknowledgements. This is, of course, the work of many people over many years. And I've tried to highlight as I went along the people responsible for each of the studies. Um, this work is all done with my colleagues and friends at the, in the ancient DNA research team at the MPI IFA, led by Svante Pebo, with the molecular work, much of it done by Matthias Meyer's group, um, population genetics by Ben Peter up in the right. And then you see a nice picture of everyone together, the ancient DNA group at the MPI IFA as well as the collaborators, the archeologists and the human evolutionists who provide us with interesting material and good questions to ask, because without them, we wouldn't have anything to work on. Also museum curators who provide us with um, 
specimens that they've worked on for many years and which provide us with interesting questions. And, and then finally, thank you very much for your attention. Hi, Janet. Thank you very, very much for your sure. brief uh, lecture. So now we have uh, time for questions. So... I think we have a couple of questions on the chat. Maybe Arthur, if you can yes. read them. Yes. So the first question is, uh, studies of ancient DNA have shown that there are no pure populations. The genetic flow between humans is greater and older than we suspected. Despite this, outside of science, a new wave of races is back to haunt us. Do you believe that scientific communication on DNA can do more to help update the narrative that circulates in the world today? That's a beautiful question. Yes, um, you're totally right. I mean, somehow we as geneticists haven't communicated perhaps as well as we could what the genetic data say about race and that there is really no correlation between what we perceive as race and genetic variation, that there's a very poor overlap between these two things. And I think there are people trying to do very good work in communicating this better. And I, I of course believe that better scientific communication on this can help, um, but it has to be, it has to be carefully done and it has to be appropriately targeted so that it's easy to understand. Because otherwise I've also seen genetic communication being used to fuel racist ideologies and theories. Uh, other question, Dr. Janet, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation full of amazing results and insights. Regarding the possible selection events of the described TLR haplotypes, is there any evidence for fitness effects of the proposed phenotypes, uh, Helicobacter pylori and Aluchis, I believe, especially at the expected population size in which such selection might have occurred, the abundance of environmentally related variables to where these phenotypes are more frequent, pollen and allergies as an example, could also shed some light in this regard. Yeah, it's an interesting question. The tolerant to receptors have turned out to be quite complicated to estimate. So the kind of fitness effects that you're asking about are e easy to estimate if you know when the selection happened and if it happened only once. I think our conclusions by looking at the, the differences in FSTs, in differences in population, in frequencies in pop between populations in, this toll in the introgressed uh, toll-like receptor haplotype suggests to us that um, there've been multiple rounds of selection potentially in response to different pathogens, perhaps even pathogens that no longer exist today. So we wouldn't even know what that pathogen is. Um, so again, I don't particularly think it's Helicobacter pylori. I think our um, the GWAS data we had available just happened to be for Helicobacter pylori. I think this is probably um, that the toll-like receptor haplotype has been selected multiple times in different places in response to different pathogens. That's my suspicion, but there's, there's not good evidence for this, I don't think. It's an interesting question. Uh, Gloria has a question. Yeah, sure. Marvelous, marvelous presentation, Janet. Thank you so much. Uh, I, have, I have a question about the progression of the, Neand the Neanderthal genomes into different regions of genes. And you showed that it's less in promoters but uh, higher in some uh, coding sequence, but not in others. But you didn't comment about the enhancer and it's higher than in coding sequence. I would like to know why. And concerning it, it, yeah. gene expressions, <laughs> enhancer are much more important than promoters. They control mm -hmm. uh, tissue specific expression and they are very, very important. Yeah, so this, there actually is a paper on, um, on enhance, the effect of introgression on enhancers from Kelly Harris's group recently, I think last year. They say that they see um, selection against Neanderthal. I'm going to summarize, I don't remember all the details, but they see they see the same as we see in promoters, selection against Neanderthal DNA 
in um, also in enhancers. We don't see it, and we don't we don't know why there's a difference. It could be that the annotation sets that we're using are different. One of the problems we run into is if you have multiple annotations for a region, it's not totally clear how you, how you should assess this, and we may be doing it differently to them. So I. I think it's possible that enhancers are also depleted. In other words, enhancers are also important. Mm -hmm. And, the, and you did an, sorry, sorry. What was the sorry. second part of the question? <laughs> no, no, the, I'd like to know if there are some uh, data linked to long no coding RNAs and intergenic sequences. What kind of data? So long non coding RNAs, I, there isn't much work on, on the effect of integration on long non coding RNAs, not that I know of. Um, there are maps of Neanderthal and Denisovan ancestry across the whole genomes of multiple individuals. So one could look at that, I think. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. The next uh, question comes from Maristara Camargo. I'm interested in immunoglobulin genes, chromosome 2, 14, and 22. They are repetitive, short, low complexity genes. I have mm -hmm. been unable to fish them out of EDUS ancient genome database. I would like to know if there is some, someone in, at your institute reassembling this loci or that would be willing to do so in a collaboration. So yes, we have, we have problems with these regions. So these regions are, as you say, highly repetitive um, and very low complexity. And with these short reads we have, we have problems placing them in the correct locations across the immunoglobulin genes and the MHC. There is no one working on it because we don't have better data. What you really need to do this properly is longer reads. Um, and unfortunately we don't have that. So we can't reconstruct it correctly at the moment. There is a paper of some years ago from Peter Parham's group trying to, um, trying to evaluate variants on the MHC in Neanderthals, these, an these analyses are very complicated. And so we, we have not tried to touch it. I would be happy to talk to you about, about how one could try and look at it, but I suspect that it will be very hard without longer reads. Okay. Next question is from Barbara Chavez. She did it in, in Portuguese, so I have to translate. So I would like to make a question to Dr. Janet, if possible to do the translation, please. Uh, first of all, congratulations for your uh, presentation, which was very good. My question is about the selection of genetic traits, and I would like to know if you think that could have occurred some kind of uh, sexual selection in this process. I think that's probably likely. Um, it's very hard, of course, to prove. Um, and that's why I pointed out when I talked about skin color and hair color, for example, that these are also sex sexually selected traits. Um, but yes, I think it's quite possible. We know, yeah, yeah, yes, I think it's possible. We, we don't, interestingly, I think that one thing that is interesting is that there's been a, there's not sexual selection, but there's been many questions about whether gene flow was sex biased, um, whether it was more Neanderthal male to uh, human female or vice versa. We don't have good evidence um, that there was sex bias. In fact, in the Y chromosome study I showed you, I showed you that the gene flow from modern humans into Neanderthals contributed both the mitochondria, which comes from the mother, and the Y from, the, from modern humans to Neanderthals, suggesting that both um, modern humans of both sexes were contributing DNA to, to the Neanderthal population. Thank you. The next question is from Gabriel Fernandez. Gabriel? Yeah, I'm here. So thank you, Janet. Uh, I have one question uh, related to COVID-19 because uh, there were some studies showing that uh, ancient, uh, an ancient cluster on chromosome 3 is related mm -hmm. to severe COVID-19. So they found that uh, most of the Europeans, they, they have most of the severe cases are in Euro Europe because they have something around 15 up to 20% of the population with this variants. Mm -hmm. And in yep. East Asia and in Africa, they have less than 1%. Yep. You think that it's something that it's exclusive for, for Neanderthals and it's not 
present also in, in the Denisovans? So we know it's not present in the Denisovans, but we would have expected East Asians to have, because East Asians also have Neanderthal ancestry, we would have expected to see this chromosome three haplotype in East Asians too, and we don't. And so if yeah. I understood the authors, authors correctly, they, they think that there might have been an earlier round of um, negative selection in Asia against this haplotype, so that there was a previous pandemic that sort of wiped out individuals carrying the risk haplotype in Asia, and that's why you don't see it in Asia. Yeah, because we can see this, 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 uh, th this locus, it's, it's relatively abundant until you reach India and after yep. India. So when you go to China, uh, so Vietnam, Japan, so it's less than yep. 1%. But yeah, it's almost, India, it's, it's almost completely absent in, in, yeah. in East Asia. Um, it's not exactly. what you would expect. So th there are many scenarios, I think, still on the table. One of them is a previous pandemic in Asia that actually was where this was disadvantageous and it was removed. And another is that it was somehow advantageous in Europe at some point for some other reason. I don't think those, those two possibilities are yet cleared up. I would suspect it's the latter, that there's, that there's some, because the frequency in Europe is high. I mean, if you expect that there's 2% yeah, really Neanderthal high. DNA, to see it at 20 to 30% is unexpected. So, so there must be some trade-off, I think, but I, I don't know. I, I'm not an, I, I mean, I know the authors of the study and I, I know they're continuing to try and work this out, but it's not so clear what's going on, I don't think. Yeah, it's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Well, there are no more questions in the chat. Uh, anybody else, would you have any question? Uh, I have a question. I think I've already told you about in, in our email. Uh, have you looked at these endogenous uh, viruses that are so common in the modern humans? Is there any difference in uh, the solvents and Neanderthals? We, we in have the distribution pattern it. or we have part? we have not looked we have not looked at this. Um, it would be something that one can look at. I think that there was a group in the US that were looking at it. I don't think they've ever published anything. Um, one has to be able to identify. So we have a problem in that we can't assemble the genomes de novo. We don't have long enough reads to assemble de novo. So we do everything by reference, right? So we align to the human reference. So if you want to go after particular um, insertions, the better way to do it is not to use our alignments but to actually fish in the raw data. So identify the breakpoints, so to say, and then fish in the raw data for sequences overlapping these breakpoints. And then you can confirm whether or not a particular um, element is present or not in that genome. And that could be done. We haven't done it. The raw, we have the raw data though that would be possible to do it with. And uh, is there any clue of what have, have happened in evolution so the Denisovans and Neanderthals just got extinct. Disappeared. I mean, for all the, <laughs> yes. yeah. I mean, it's there a good question. I, there's lots of speculation, right? I, so everyone has a pet theory. Um, so some of the theories are that this very low genetic diversity at some point led to an immune meltdown in um, the archaic populations. We looked at this, we actually looked over time, right? So you would expect if this were true, that if you have two Neanderthals, one of 100,000 years ago old and one of 40,000 years old, you should see um, a decrease in, in diversity over that period of time. And we don't, we see that it's completely stable. It's low, but it doesn't, it's not dropping. And in fact, we see that the diversity in the MHC is higher than we would expect. Um, so I don't think it was an immune meltdown. I, people have talked about climate, people have talked about being outcompeted by modern humans who are much larger groups. My favorite theory is that given the amount of introgression we see, given the amount of admixture we're beginning to see, that at the point that modern humans arrived in Eurasia, the Neanderthals were in small, quite dispersed groups, and that it's quite possible that they were just absorbed into the modern human populations. That would be my 
my suspicion at this point. I think some of them may have died out in refugia, but the, the groups that were met might just have been absorbed. And that's why we see the amount of the Anatol ancestry. Thank you. Ari? Uh, I jump uh, I am very interested in ancient metagenomics or ancient microbiomes. I think it, it will be a fantastic research line in the next years. And I would like that you, uh, if you could tell us what uh, your group and inside your institute uh, what are you doing mm -hmm. from now? So I would say there are two lines. The first is um, the more recent work we're doing in, in our small, what we call the sort of archaic genomes group. So this is a group that are interested particularly in archaic humans, Neanderthals, Nisibans, and anything older, mm -hmm. is a move towards realizing that we don't have so many bones and teeth but that we have lots of sediment, lots of sand from all the cave sites where these people lived. And what you can do then is you can um, take samples of this sediment and you can use capture arrays like I showed you for the Y chromosome yes. to capture informative sites about, about you know, is, were Neanderthals present, were Denisovans present, were modern humans present. And so at a particular site, you can from the, from the mammalian DNA, from the hominin DNA in the sediment reconstruct inhabitation of a site. Mm -hmm. And you can do it at the level of um, assigning to groups, Neanderthal, Denisovan, or modern human. And you can even be a little bit more sensitive if you, if you have enough data and you can say what kind of Neanderthals, you know, are they more related to these ones or those ones. That's not microbiomes per se, right? That's really sediment DNA. It's another way to get good human DNA. There's no one looking at very old microbes in those sediments at the moment. There is another department in our institute that studies um, early modern humans, so modern humans from 30,000 years ago through to the present. Mm -hmm. And they have a number of research groups that are looking at pathogen um, and microbe sequences, um, largely from burials, some sort of later burials where you can actually know this is a bunch of people who were buried because they died during the Black Death. And then you can actually extract the pathogens out from the bone samples of those individuals. Um, and I don't know a tremendous amount of, of all the projects they have running. They have projects running looking at mammalian distributions over time, so looking at farming and the um, advent of farming in, in Eurasia. They have projects looking at dairying. So when did people start herding animals using, again, using sort of microbiome type analyses of uh, interesting talks on, you know, looking at uh, pottery and looking to see whether there's evidence for milk proteins in the pottery as evidence for, for dairying. Um, these kinds of analyses are not trivial, I think, because you need a very clever pipeline to assess clearly what the what the metagenome what what you have in the metagenome right what if you get some some joint sample identifying reliably from very few fragments one what microbe is present and two that it's truly ancient yes right? yes that it's not I, some I, modern contaminant uh, the the most problematic issue to separate what is ancient and what is modern yeah uh, I mean, the cool thing is this deamination pattern. So we use this deamination pattern, the C to T that deamination on the molecules as a signal of ancientness. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of expect to see on, on Neanderthals, for example, 30 to 40% of the molecules that are carrying deamination at a site. And if they don't, then we don't believe we have ancient DNA. Okay. And uh, my last question, just uh, uh, really brief. Yeah. Uh, uh, your group, your institute, uh, because you, you, uh, you work with uh, um, DNA with archaeological age. Uh, yes. do, you have, uh, do you have any joint collaboration with groups that work with uh, ancient DNA in paleontological age much more further? At at the moment, we are, so, 
<laughs> so at the moment, <laughs> so one of the big not ancient. It's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so we have in our department had a um, an aim of working on the oldest specimens that we can get our hands on, mm-hmm. um, but with a particular interest in, in humans, right? So we're, we're not particularly interested in, ah, in any yeah. other species. So we really are only interested in humans, <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> um, and there, what we've tried to do with developing both the molecular and the computational methods is okay. to drive back the age of the samples that we can look at. So we, uh-huh. you know, Neanderthals are 40,000, 50,000, up to 100,000 years old. The SEMA individuals, are at the moment the oldest from which we have DNA. And they're, if the date's to be believed, 400,000 years old. Okay. Um, but the DNA from those SEMA individuals is terribly badly preserved. I mean, the ne- it makes the Neanderthals look beautiful. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, I can't even tell you what the average read length is because it's so short. <laughs> we don't even see the tail of the distribution. <laughs> But our aim is to go older. Um, mm-hmm. It's still a bit of a question, what's the oldest that we can uh, can get? Um, at the moment, there's a big move to lots of proteomics, mm-hmm. um, ancient proteomics, mm-hmm. where methods are being developed and have been shown to be able to retrieve DNA from even old DNA proteins from even older specimens. But of course, you don't get population genetic information from single protein, single yeah. amino acid loci. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, Janet. Uh, You've shown uh, uh, examples uh, with a toll-like receptor, the gene for skin color, etc. I wonder if I I am curious about uh, another gene uh, and would like to assess the information. I would like to ask you if you are happy with uh, uh, the, the, the available information in central repositories. Or do you, do you think that would be great to have a, a, a repository of information uh, more a, a, a centered on the the ancient human genomes? I mean, uh, the information that you access in your local uh, data available to you is is quite easier to to find the gene, etc., and, and to run those studies. What do you th- mm-hmm. do you think? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that we've, so all the genomes that we've sequenced, or in fact, all the data that we've generated from these specimens, we put in public repositories. So they're always submitted to the European Nucleotide Archive. Mm -hmm. However, the collation of information so that you can actually extract information per gene is is harder to get at, I have to admit. We haven't made such a good job of that. And so what we've been doing is talking to the EBI about um, including our archaic genomes in some kind of um, archaic genome portal that if they can be analyzed together with all the tools that are available through um, Mm -hmm. the EBI services. And that's something that I think will help a lot to put things out. We have a genome browser on our website, which allows you Mm -hmm. to sort of go and look at what we have, but it's it's not beautiful like the EBI um, services. And I think we could do better by just giving all our, all everything we know to them. I was wondering if we an integration with ENCODE, maybe? That's an interesting idea. Um, ENCODE is mostly, I mean, we, we don't have RNA, right? So we only have, we only have genomes. So we can only tell you about the uh-huh. regulatory architecture, but not about what the effect is. Um, in uh, some ways well, we need either cell lines uh-huh. or, or genomes. We don't have RNA. It, it actually was a mistake. It was not meaning ENCODE, it was, it was meaning we had a seminar, let's say. Uh, I'll check. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that we there could. I think that there is a space to do better in making the data easier to access for people who are uh-huh. not bioinformaticists. Because I think right, anyone probably here can take our uh-huh. our BAM files or our VCF files and use them. But uh-huh. and non-experts have more trouble. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was meaning encode, but not the encode transcription database. They have a, a nice, a nice uh, database on enhancers today. Yeah, we had a oh, talk yeah. from from Zping from yeah. I can. Yeah, I the website is very nice. Yeah, exactly. 
I did not know the site, did not know how to explore the data out yeah. there. But anyhow, uh, would be nice to have it's a website, a, 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 a mm -hmm. site from you, actually, because uh, it's, it's kind of hard to access the information, right? It's true. You're right. Yeah. I think it's something that in, I had to recently write a proposal, and in that proposal, I said yeah. that's one thing we could do better. I think uh -huh. it's true. Like, uh, how many how many protein coding genes are ready to go if I would like to to assess the information in, in Neanderthal genome, for instance? Very that is few. A good. Do I have so, to dig the information? I mean, we have available. What we would provide is actually just all the positions where the Neanderthal or Denisovan genomes differ from the modern human, right? So you can sort of take the modern human as a framework, as a, as a skeleton, mm -hmm. and then just flip out the bases that we have. That's easily available. Uh -huh. Ah, okay. And do you have like it is available in a website, internet, a tool mm -hmm. or something like that? Yep. On our, on, our, uh, if, on our website, you can find it there. If you, want, if you don't find it, drop me an email. <laughs> so okay. the VCF files for every genome are there. Uh-huh. All right. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay, I think that we don't have any more questions. Yeah. Okay, Janet, thanks very much Thank once you. again for accepting. Thank the you. Question. It's been such and a pleasure. Thank you for the enthusiastic for discussion. Thank you, Janet. Thank you very <laughs> much. Yeah, you know, it's part of the internalization effort that we yeah. have in our PhD <laughs> program. So it's great uh, that the students can uh, see you, know you, listen to you, and uh, interact. You know, improve, uh, it's really interact, right? It's a great audience. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, 115 at the peak. One hundred. <laughs> yeah. And that's a big proof. I, I can't see everyone now on my screen. I can only see like fifty at a time. In the middle of your presentation, we we had one hundred and fifteen people at <laughs> That's a huge group. So it's a, These it's seminars a, look amazing. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yep. Thanks Thank a lot you. for coming. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. bye, -bye. bye. <laughs> Cheers. You. See you all soon. See you. Bom ver vocês. Legal, de né, Arthur Gruber? Muito bom. Miguelito. É. Grande Miguelito. Tem povo. Ali já saiu? É. é. Carlos Men, que esteve aqui assistindo, ele, ele chegou um pouquinho depois daquela hora que a gente ficou pedindo para o pessoal falar oi, né? Mas o Menk estava aqui, nosso coordenador da nossa sub-área, né? E ele assistiu até o finalzinho aqui. Esse senhor Paulo Beirão também esteve por aqui. Eu ia pedir para abrir câmera para dar um oi também, é, só para registrar também. Legal, legal. Então, nós estamos mais ou menos nessa faixa de passando um pouquinho de 100 nos vários seminários, né? Mas, mais importante um de tudo, eu acho que vocês estão com o um programa de seminários de altíssimo nível. Então, é, isso é uma então, coisa inédita no Brasil na área. Uh -huh. é, então, a, a gente estava fazendo antes do X-Meeting com alguns speakers que até foram para lá, sabe? Dois foram para lá, o Henning e a, é, a moça lá do, do GATK. A gente estava fazendo com o Skype na sala de reunião, e eles mesmo com outro computador controlando os slides deles, sabe? A gente ia ficar nessa, nessa coisa meio improvisada, assim. Então, a gente já estava pensando em ter internacionais, né? E quando a gente se adaptou a esse Zoom, foi muito legal. O pessoal do, do, que, de Natal também está sempre em peso... Tem gente do LNCC, tem uma galera do Rio Grande do Sul, de Campinas. Acho que eu vi o Marcelo Brígido por aí de, tava, de Brasília. Tava assim. tava, tava, né? Então, vem uma galerinha. A gente está tentando ver se fica mais popular, né? E quando chegar lá para agosto, já começar a programar o ano que vem, ver como é que a gente faz, né? Se quiser uhum. comentar com a B3C, se quiser fazer um negócio mais organizado. Agora, por exemplo, hoje é o, é o seminário normal dos nossos seminários, foi o nosso seminário de abertura. 
aí por isso que tem essa periodicidade mês a mês, que a gente vai intercalando com os dos alunos, né? Os alunos Sim. falam, tal, não sei o quê, aí chega no final do mês, pá, tem mais um, tal, né? Dá uma onda, né? Para os estudantes não, tá, tá, verem... Está excelente, acho que vocês estão de não, parabéns. Não pesa iniciativa. muito como um congresso assim também, né? Mas o pessoal vem, né? participa, não, conversa bastante... Vocês delegaram para pessoas em diferentes programas de pós para fazer a é. coordenar os seminários, quer dizer, vocês estão abrindo para várias pessoas Sim, do Brasil. É. É, vai do encontro que a gente está fazendo na B3C de criar as regionais, começar a descentralizar um pouco e Isso. criar lideranças e núcleos bastante fortes em cada uma das regiões do Brasil. É fantástico. Legal, é. Então, meus parabéns. <coughs> Eu, infelizmente, a gente, infelizmente, a gente não tem se visto pessoalmente, né? A última vez que eu fui para BH, já deve fazer o quê? Um ano e meio. E a última vez que eu ia, foi cancelado justamente quando começou a, a pandemia, e aí deu no que deu, né? Vamos então, torcer para que isso se resolva o mais rápido possível. Porque, é. porque não dá para é. comer pão de queijo por Zoom, né? Nem tomar cachaça por Zoom. Tem uns bons pão de queijo aí em São Paulo que, na verdade, é mineiro que fabrica, né? Tem o Dona Lucinha aí, né? É, mas é. acho que tem, tem, tem dois Dona Lucinha aqui, deve ter uns dois ou três aí também. Então, uh, mas é claro, né? Vir aqui, a gente pode ir no italiano, né? Pois Daqui é. do lado, é isso daí. Muito bom. Obrigado aí por ter Obrigado. agitado, conseguido a, a speaker, excelente speaker. Muito ela, joia. Ela, ela, é, ela é fora de série, né? Ela, é, eu conheci mano. ela em 2002. Ela era aluna de pós-graduação do Inheit. Você conhece o Inheit, né? Uhum. E já era brilhante na época. E, e impressionante, porque ela defendeu em 2003, 2004, ela já estava no Max Planck, já montando o grupo e desenvolvendo uhum. tudo que vocês viram. É... Fora de série. Muito Super bacana. Super bacana. Joia. Então Legal. tá joia. Miguelito, grande abraço. Grande abraço grande a todos. Grande abraço. E vamos, vamos uhum. mantendo contato. Se precisar também da B3C, é só falar. Tá joia. Valeu, valeu. Obrigado. Tchau a tchau, todos. Tchau. Boa tarde. Tchau, gente. Como dizem os teletubbies, hora de dar tchau. <risos> E aí você pega a lista para mim, Tiago, você está por aí, né? Lista de presença para a gente ver de onde vieram as pessoas. Isso, já te passa é? a tá bom?